you can imagine my my shock and and horror to see that uh, Lola and and her family were growing up in a police jury ward and being listed as black. And I think that's why these stories are falling through the cracks. I think that's why these stories aren't being taught or discussed. It comes into play when considering the Campty Free Blacks, except Gabriel Grepp, and the Guilleries of St. Laundry Parish, which I'm also related to. These men found themselves with a choice in the late summer or early fall of 1864. They could enlist in combat units or wait for conscription as laborers. A Natchitoches Free Black wrote from one labor camp, quote, we are in a way slaves. Hi, I'm Danielle Romero. Thank you so much for being with me here on my channel where we talk about American identity and family stories. And this video is part of a series I'm doing. I'm kind of alternating every other week with kind of big American history and then my family history. So today I want to tell you about my grandmother's grandfather, my grandmother's grandfather. She never met him. I don't think she knew anything about him. He was born in Louisiana in 1875. And I don't have any pictures of him. My cousin Paige and I, we, we share this uh, ancestor and we were talking about how like, <laughs> what could we do? How could we find a photo of him? And she is originally from Louisiana and her grandparents still live in this area. And she was like, maybe I should go to every single antique store and just like go through all the bins of old photos. I don't have a picture of him. So for the photo on the thumbnail, what I did was I had someone help me use AI to use photos of the family members I do have and kind of recreate what he could have looked like. But I want to get into that a little bit more. Let me tell you his story. So he was born in 1875 in Louisiana. Imagine a life where your very identity shifts from one record to another, where one day you're classified as black and then another mulatto, even occasionally as white, however crazy that sounds. This is the reality for my great, great grandfather, Alphonse Perot. His story isn't just a personal journey, although it is very personal for me, but I think studying his story is another window into the complex and contradictory nature of American identity. His story offers a really fascinating glimpse of the post-reconstruction life for African Americans in the South. Now, I actually wasn't sure if I should call him African American. Now, he was listed as Black on a lot of census records, and we have connections to enslaved African ancestors on his side, but they were Creole. They were mixed. Uh, his first language was Creole. When the French came into Natchitoches and they took chitty matcha women hostage and married them and had children and so I descend from that line one of the sisters was Marie Therese de Grand Terre and she had a sister named I think Marie Jeannie or Marie Jean and that's a well-known you know, historical fact there are signs about that in the area uh, I actually got to take a picture with the sign when I went down in Louisiana already right from the beginning someone who is descending from French, from Native American, from Chinimacha, from enslaved African Americans, and getting put into this catch-all of black, but then mulatto, but then white, and you're conscripted to fight for the Confederacy, but you're conscripted as a laborer. And it's not clear-cut. His daughter is my great-grandmother. Her first language was Creole. And so there's a complexity here. And, and it's going to get even more complex when we talk about his father's experience during the Civil War. I want to get to that. So he was the head of his household and he lived in police jury ward four. That was Natchitoches, Louisiana. And Alphonse at this point was a 24 year old black man married to Victoria Perot, who's my great great grandmother. And during the late 19th and 20th centuries, this was a huge, significant social political change shift in Louisiana, particularly for those with African heritage. It was not cut and dry. Um, following the end of Reconstruction, African Americans in Louisiana faced increasing racial segregation and disenfranchisement under Jim Crow laws. Now, despite these challenges, there were many people, like my great-great-grandfather, Alphonse, who worked to build stable lives for themselves and their families. But during this time, there was something called a police jury system, and this was the predominant form of local government in Louisiana. This was totally new to me. I grew up in upstate New York. So the police jury system was established in 1811 when the territory of Orleans, later the state of Louisiana, implemented a local governance structure to manage different administrative functions. 
So each parish was divided into wards, and then each ward had jurors that they were electing, and these were the people that formed the, the police jury, and they were kind of the legislative and executive body of the parish government. So this was like the, the hands and feet of the government. So I'm going to read uh, something from the original legislation of 1811 that clearly articulated the responsibilities of the police juries. Quote, be it enacted by the legislative council and the House of Representatives of the Territory of Orleans that the parish juries are hereby authorized to establish Gendra Mary, I think that's how you say it, uh, whose duty it shall be to go after runaway Negroes and maintain good order among the slaves, unquote. So as the years progressed, the same mechanisms were used to control enslaved populations, and then it was uh, repurposed to enforce segregation in the South. So you can imagine my my shock and, and horror to see that uh, Lola and, and her family were growing up in a police jury ward and being listed as black. I want to tell you about Alphonse's father because this is where stuff gets really crazy. Like, I did a video on this and, and I still am struggling with what what is happening in this story. So my great-great-grandfather was the son of another Alphonse Perot. So he's named after his dad. His father was Alphonse Perot and his uncle was Joseph G. Perot. They were part of a group of free men of color from the Camden area who served, served, we're gonna get to that, in the Confederate Army during the Civil War. Something from 1986, it was from the uh, journal Civil War History and it's called Free Men of Color in Gray. I'm gonna jump down to it, I'm gonna share it on the screen because it's talking about my family. It's talking about Alphonse's dad and brother. So let's hop over there. I'm going to just do a control find. So we're talking about the Civil War and my family is in the South. So they're talking about free men of color, what their interaction was in the Civil War from the Campti area. So he says the eight remaining free men of color from the Campti area served in Company H, 6th Louisiana Cavalry with Gabrielle Grapp. And I'm related to the Grapps as well. Um, and I'm going to skip down. Two others, Joseph G. and Alphonse Perot, were brothers born in 1843 and 1838, respectively. So the Alphonse I'm talking about in this video, this is his dad and this is his brother. They were the sons of Valerie Perot and Marie Felonize Coinde. Um, and both men operated farms. Now, Marie Felonize Coinde, it's sometimes just Condi and... We've talked about that family a lot on this channel. The Condi family come from enslaved people. So the service of these men came to my attention through a letter written by Lieutenant J. Alphonse Prudholm, the Confederate enrolling or conscript officer in Akadish. So they had a Confederate officer there who was, who was getting people signed up basically to join the Confederate army. And there was a letter and my ancestors were in this letter. So on October 1st, 1864, Prudhomme wrote to his superiors in Shrev Shreveport that he had discovered the Perot brothers and McGee Grapp in possession of passes from one of their lieutenants. The three privates told Prudhomme that the other five men had joined Captain Love's company also. Prudhomme reported that he had enrolled the Perots and Grapp under the provisions of an order calling for conscription of free men of color as laborers. So there was some, there were some issues whether or not these men should be conscripted. Now, you have to remember, uh, yes, they were the descendants of enslaved African-Americans, um, but they were also now free men of color. They owned farms. And a lot of people from the Campti area were, were being conscripted into the Confederate Army. And so this was an order calling for the conscription of free men of color as laborers. I, I don't think that that means that they were choosing to enroll as Confederate soldiers. I, I don't know their hearts and minds, but a conscription is, as far as I know, not of your free will. And as laborers, that's important. So hold on to that. So while he was waiting for a reply, basically saying, like, should we let these guys be conscripted or what? Prude Holmes sent Alphonse, is my third grandfather, uh, on October 7th to Alexandria to serve as a laborer. So probably digging ditches. I, I don't really know. And his brother Joseph received orders to appear before a medical examining board no later than October 16th to determine if his health would permit him to do heavy labor. 
No further information on him has come to light and his ultimate fate is unknown. Prudhomme's record book showing enrollments of free blacks contains no entry after December 18th, 1864. He may have eventually enrolled these last four men as laborers or at least forced them out of active service in Love's company. Another factor related to this was their view of their place in society. It comes into play when considering the Campty Free Blacks, except Gabriel Grepp, in the Guilleries of St. Laundry Parish, which I'm also related to. These men found themselves with a choice in the late summer or early fall of 1864. They could enlist in combat units or wait for conscription as laborers. A Natchitoches Free Black wrote from one labor camp, quote, We are, in a way, slaves. He described the squalor of the camp and told his wife, quote, the Negroes, and then parentheses slaves, are treated better than we are. We are obliged to do the hardest kind of work and the Negro looks on. So to avoid the degrading conditions of the work of labor camps where they would find the same treatment given to the slaves around them, these men chose an action that would emphasize their distinctiveness from other blacks. Alphonse's father Alphonse, I think, highlights the complex dynamics of race and allegiance during the Civil War era when a lot of things were on the table and these men, you know, operated farms, contributed to the local economy, but they still weren't considered you know, equal to people who were white. They could be conscripted, but they were being conscripted as, as laborers. I, I don't know if this was always true, but this is what was true for my family. And I just think the contradictions in my great-great-grandfather's racial classifications, his experiences, his family story reflect the broader societal dynamics of Louisiana. And Louisiana's history is unique, but I think it is, it is a, a microcosm of the American experience and, and the American experience that is becoming more and more common. And I think that's why these stories are falling through the cracks. I think that's why these stories aren't being taught or discussed because now, I mean, I'm speaking now as a, as a teacher, a former teacher, you can't have nuance. You can't have question marks over things. We need to be able to wrap up uh, the story with the moral in 40 minutes or less. And there's a takeaway and there's no time to just let it sit and percolate and, and think about this. And so I'm so thankful to have you here with me, learning along with me. And I think sometimes while we're learning, and I don't feel like I have an answer, but I have more questions, I think that's a good thing. I do. So if you'd like to watch the rest of this series so far, I'll leave a link to it below. Otherwise, we'll talk soon.